Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. I know we can never sufficiently thank God for everything, but is there a best way we can show gratitude? By loving and using the gift that God has given us. Think about it. If you've given someone something, especially someone you love, what's the best gratitude you want? I mean, certainly you'd love them to say thank you and smile and appreciate it, but that's over very quickly. Really, what do we want from the gifts that we give our loved ones? We want them to love what we've given them. If you bake me a cake and you bring it to me and I say, oh, wow, that's so great. Thank you so much. I love you so much. But I never touch the cake. Are you going to be fully happy? You're going to keep saying, well, but, but try the cake. And then if I say, oh, thank you so much, I love you, you're still going to say, but, but try the cake. Like, I made you the cake. Eat the cake. <laughs> right? We're not going to be fully satisfied as givers just to hear thank you so much if what the person is thanking us for, they're also simultaneously ignoring and having nothing to do with. And in the same way, I think that God, who's given us this extraordinary life, not only wants our gratitude for the gift of life, but I think also wants us to actually enjoy the gift we've been given and actually use the gift we've been given. And so the best way to really show gratitude to God or to anyone is to fully, fully love and fully utilize what they've given you. And so God has given us our life, of course, but God has also given us this, this extraordinary creation. And so I think that God wants us to also love and experience the joy of, the exquisiteness of, this creation. And it's interesting because on a spiritual level, there's a lot of spiritual practices that are rooted in a withdrawal so, for example, we fast, we don't eat food, or we stay awake all night, we 
don't sleep. We take vows of celibacy. We practice meditative techniques that make us realize we are not the body, but that we are the soul, the spirit, the consciousness. And those are essential in order not to be a slave of the senses, not to be a slave of the calls or the temptations. And of course, some of us who have chosen a path of renunciation, it includes vows of celibacy and renunciation. But I think in general, I think God really wants us to, to enjoy the creation. And so I think that flowers smell so beautifully because I think the divine creator actually wants us to enjoy the smell of the flowers. And I think that sunsets are so beautiful and sunrises are so beautiful. And babies' faces are so beautiful. And the trees are so beautiful. Because I think that the universe actually really wants us to, to enjoy them. And that the highest spiritual achievement is not about, I walked through a garden of roses and I didn't notice anything. Or it's raining on this beautiful earth but I'm not enjoying the smell. Or I'm hearing exquisite music, but I didn't enjoy it. I think that the best way to really express that, that gratitude to God is to fully, fully love, fully appreciate care for, protect, preserve, utilize the gifts that God has given us, which means our own lives, our own bodies, to, to love them, to enjoy them, to realize what extraordinary miracles of creation they are. I mean, that we, that we take in nonsense, pizza and french fries and coke and chocolate bars and, and this incredible body turns that into energy? I mean, it's amazing. Put junk in your car, it won't run at all. Put it in your body and this extraordinary creation actually is able to turn even junk into function. It's amazing what we've been given. And to really appreciate it, but also utilize it, to realize it's been given for a reason. When we give someone a gift, we think a hundred times, especially if it's someone we love, oh, what's going to be the best gift? What are they going to love the most? What's going to be the most useful for them? And you really think about that person. What could, what could I possibly give them that they could really, really use? Now you think about God giving us this life, this body, these circumstances. But the gift that he's giving, of course, isn't a gift to the body because the body is very temporary. It's a gift he's giving to us as, as soul, as spirit, as that eternal existence. So as God's given us this, this life, it's a matter of, okay, what does this soul, this karmic package with the soul need that's going to be the most conducive, the best best set of circumstances and skills and abilities and karma 
challenges that will force them to push through and expand their wings. The best tool that they can be for what the universe also needs. Because, of course, our lives are not only gifts to us. It's a gift to the universe. So when we were, when we were given life, it was a gift to us and a gift to the universe. Of what did the universe need right now? So love it. Love it, enjoy it, appreciate it, protect it, preserve it, and utilize it in the best way that the giver of this gift must have imagined and envisioned for you. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single... Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Alaya, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. So how do we deal with our addiction to our devices? It's it's an addiction to distraction. And it's important to know, by the way, that Apple or Android or any of the makers of the devices we have are not the cause of this problem. Thousands and thousands of years ago, when our scriptures were transmitted to us, it was already speaking in the scriptures about how to deal with the monkey mind, how to deal with the mind that was constantly jumping all over the place, how to stay grounded and anchored. So don't think that it's all your phone's fault. This is just yet another way for us already primed to distraction, primed to being reactive to that in my world. It's just yet another tool that the universe has put in our hands. So it isn't the fault of the device. They're just a tool. And they're a fantastic tool actually to help us connect to the world in really positive ways. They're a fantastic tool to help us be efficient and effective in so many ways. But it's like fire. Fire can either cook your food as a wonderful help, a wonderful tool, or it can burn your house down. It's not fire's fault. It's the mind. And so most of us these days, every time that device blinks or bings or rings or bleeps, we react. Ah, okay. Immediately. But there's a lot of ways around that. And the first step, of course, is to to deal with the addiction in the most logistic way. So for example, turn off your notifications. It's very, very simple. All of our apps have the option to either get a 
bleep, a bling, a light, a ring, a something. When someone has sent us a message or when someone has liked something or shared something. But just because something has happened on my Facebook page or on my Instagram page or in my email doesn't mean I need to jump. I should have the reins of my life in my hands, whether it's a reaction on my Facebook page or a reaction of a person sitting right in front of me. That same ability to discriminate, that's mine. How many of us move through the world and say, oh, you made me angry. I was so peaceful. Then you came in the room. Or I was having a great day. Then you came home. Or I was in a great mood. Then you talked to me. It's your fault. You made me mad. You ruined my mood. You stole my peace. But that's an illusion. That's ignorance. No one has the power to steal my peace. No one has the power to make me angry. If I choose to react in anger to something someone else says or does, that's my choice. If I choose to react in jealousy or pain to something someone else says or does, that's my choice. So that same lesson of sort of spirituality 101 that we all learn in the very beginning, no reaction, as Pooja Swamiji teaches, to have the reins of our life in our hands. Well, that same teaching applies to our devices. When I learn not to react to the words or the actions or how people are dressing or what they're doing around me, that applies to what my device is doing. My device bleeps, it bings, it lights up, it rings. Well, I also have the ability not to react. Or I get an email or a phone call or an SMS that says something. I have the choice. First, I have the choice to read it now or not. And if I do read it, I have the choice of to react or to respond. And if I'm going to respond, do I need to respond immediately? All of this is just a new way for us to navigate the world of reaction. So first of all, turn off your notifications, or at least turn them off for everyone who isn't. Your child, or your spouse, or your parent, or whoever those are whose notifications you want, turn off the rest. Your phone also has this beautiful thing called flight mode. You can turn it off so it won't ring. It won't do anything. It has modes like do not disturb. Calls don't come through, messages don't come through unless it's an emergency from your loved one. The point being, there's all sorts of ways logistically to navigate it, but I have to take that control in the same way that I take the control of reacting to the world around me. The truth is, the universe is just going to keep presenting us more and more things to react to. Technology is here to stay. One minute it's a computer, then it's a phone in my hand, now it's on my wrist as a watch. Soon, who knows, they're going to stick you know, a chip in my, in my mind, in my brain. But with every one of these pieces of technology comes an option, an opportunity I have to decide. How much control do I want? And that control leads to freedom. And freedom is our highest spiritual calling. When we speak about moksha, moksha means freedom. But people a lot of times think it means freedom after you die. Like, I become free of this body, then I have moksha. 
But the ultimate moksha is freedom in this body while I'm living, but freedom from the games of the mind. And it's the mind that says, oh, I better see what somebody posted on my Facebook page. I better see this instant message. I better see what's come on Instagram. This is just today's flavor of reaction. It's today's flavor of distraction, today's flavor of desires, and therefore today's flavor of opportunity to not react. So take care of your notifications and make sure that you have times of your day, maybe rooms of your house that are device free. And you don't need me to tell you what they should be. Everybody has their own, their own home situation, their own family situation. But make sure to have certain times of the day, certain rooms of your house that are device free. And right now, especially, especially as we are sent to our beautiful caves. Yes, one option is just binge watch Netflix. But another option and something that as we emerge from this time is actually going to be something that will be building blocks of the transformation of me, building blocks of me actually unfolding, opening to the truth of who I am is going to be spiritual practice. All the days that you had thought, I'm going to get up early and meditate, but then you didn't have time because you had to rush off to work. You slept in because you were kept up late in the night with work. Well, as you're home now, think of it as a new opportunity to meditate. Whatever time of the day it is when you get up, meditate. Chances are you don't have somewhere else you have to go anyway. So meditate. Do more spiritual reading. Do more chanting. Do more whatever your spiritual practice includes. Do more yoga. Get your body healthy. Spend time on your mat. These devices of technology either can be that, which gives us TV serials that we binge watch, or they can be ways of tuning into satsang. Ways of taking yoga classes online, ways of meditating online, ways of watching all of those inspiring videos of the teachers, the leaders you love, who touch you, who inspire you. Watch those. There's nothing wrong with watching something, but take care what you watch. And spend some time also reading. Because while it's beautiful to watch, it's also beautiful to read. And if you live somewhere where you can take walks outside, get out. Take walks outside. Try some new vegetarian recipes. We're going to be sharing also some beautiful home Indian vegetarian cooking recipes. Think about all sorts of things you can do. Are you an artist but you've never actually spent some time painting, spend some time painting, write poetry, do whatever it is that you haven't been doing because you didn't have time. And again, realize the device isn't the problem. It can either be a tool of just distraction or it can be a tool of connection and upliftment and inspiration. Use it as that. Use this time. The universe has given it to us. We can't rewind history and undo coronavirus. So here we are. Stay home, stay healthy, but stay engaged, stay connected, and stay inspired. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. 
Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. I try not to get too caught up in semantics. We could spend a lot of time looking at the semantic, etymological aspects of different words, which of course ends up getting much more complex when you realize that most of these words that we're talking about come to us from Sanskrit. So what we're also dealing with is not even just the word itself, but we're dealing with a definition of it, a translation of it and therefore a whole other etymology, a whole other semantics. For me, what's much more important is, what does it mean for me? And so when we think about awareness, awareness is pretty clear. Awareness is, am I aware? Am I moving through the world? Mindful and aware. Am I watching myself, my own thoughts, my own instincts, my own motivations, my own intentions? Am I really clear, both on the inside and the outside? Because awareness is something that goes in two directions got to be aware outside as well, otherwise you're going to trip and fall every time you walk down the steps. Otherwise you're going to pick up a glass to drink and pour it over your shoulder instead. So everything in the world, whatever we do, requires awareness, requires mindfulness, whether you're balancing a checkbook, driving a car, whatever you're doing, We need to be aware. But we also need that awareness to go inward. So it's not just the world outside. It's the world inside. Who is the I driving the car? Who is the I drinking the water? Who is the I walking down the steps? Am I aware of that being? Am I aware of the thoughts? Am I aware of the patterns? So that's awareness. You can think about it as mindfulness, presence. Am I fully present in that moment? Now you can also think about it as conscious. This is when we speak about consciousness. So we could also speak about it as conscious. You can absolutely use conscious as a synonym for aware, consciousness as a synonym for awareness. Am I conscious in every moment? 
Because, of course, we don't mean conscious in terms of the actual brainwave activity. When most of us speak of consciousness, we're not talking about are you in a coma or not? Do you have activity in your cerebral cortex or not? We're not using medical definitions. All of us have activity in our cerebral cortex. We're not in a coma by sheer fact that we're here together in satsang. So we're all conscious on that level. But are we conscious here? Because it even goes a step farther. And again, I wouldn't worry about it semantically. You could talk about being aware on a step deeper or being conscious on a step deeper. Either way. But it goes another step, which is not only being aware and conscious of who the I is that's driving the car or moving through my life or the thoughts that I'm having or the pattern that I'm having. But also, am I able to be conscious of consciousness? Am I able to be aware of awareness? So that takes it a step deeper. On the most superficial level, I'm just acting. I'm just moving. Go in one step. I'm aware. I'm aware of what I'm doing. I'm conscious of what I'm doing. I'm mindful. I'm here. When we talk about be here now, that's exactly what it means. Obviously, you are here. Nobody has to tell you be here where you are. It's the mind. It's your awareness. It's your consciousness. But then... There's another layer. Because there is an element within us that is aware of awareness, that is conscious of consciousness. And when you touch that, that's when you start to touch what we talk about as pure awareness or pure consciousness. Where it's not, I as my individual self am aware of the individual thoughts or feelings or intentions or motivations or patterns that I as an individual have. But I've now stepped back and I am sitting in a place that is aware of myself being aware. And then, of course, it doesn't matter whether I'm aware of me driving or aware of me drinking water or aware of me screaming at my kids or my spouse or my employees because I'm just being aware of awareness. What I'm being aware of is a product of just that second level. But that third level, is aware of awareness, is conscious of consciousness. And so it loses all of the individuality of it. And that's when we start to really tap into that experience of no place I end and the world begins, that experience of just pure consciousness. That's not about me and my consciousness, but me tapping into just consciousness. So don't worry so much about the, the differences between them, between the words. Worry about the differences between the levels and the layers. And just keep trying to go deeper and deeper and keep asking yourself, is this it or is there another layer? Can I be aware of myself being aware? Can I be aware of myself being aware of myself being aware? Just keep going. Because eventually we hit that just spaciousness when there's 
no longer anything to be aware of. There's just awareness. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Meditation is all of that. Yes, we pierce through the veil of multiplicity. Absolutely. We begin as separate. Me, here, body. On a mat. External world. And as I meditate, that distinction between internal and external shifts. As we are aware of our breath in meditation, as we are focusing on the breath, we notice in the beginning that when we inhale, we are bringing into us from the external world, right? We're inhaling oxygen. We're inhaling energy from outside to inside. And as we exhale, we're releasing from the inside to the outside. We release carbon dioxide. Out. So there's this movement of outer to inner and inner to outer. But if you sit still long enough with the awareness merged into the breath, and you don't move the body and you don't move the mind, what happens is you lose that sense of where inner ends and outer begins. And so suddenly there is no inner. There is no outer. There is no breather. There just is breathing or breath. And we fall into a state of connection, oneness. And slowly that expands into not just the physical space around me, but oneness with the divine, oneness with all. So absolutely, meditation is the great merger. And that's where in the the eight limbs of yog that the sage Patanjali gave us, we begin at the foundation, of course, with yamaniyam. 
And then as we move all the way up to samadhi, right before samadhi is dhyan. So samadhi is the union, ultimate union. But right before that is meditation. So meditation is that which takes us into ultimate union. But is that all it does? It does so much. It, it purifies our, our sight. Now, of course, all of this that I'm giving now is just different ways of describing the same phenomenon. Because that experience of oneness is your true self. It is the divine union. It is samadhi. It is thatness when we chant so hum. I am that. We merge into thatness. As we are conscious, we become conscious of consciousness. As we are aware, we become aware of awareness. And so it shows us that truth, that truth of who we are that that cleans the whole window through which we see the world, even once we open our eyes. Because when we open our eyes, of course, we have to get back into, at least on a physical level, the rest of the world. So you don't want to trip over the table on your way out of your meditation room. You don't want to be so at one with the table that you fall over it. But that glass has been cleared and cleaned so that I can see the truth. I can see the divine. Puja Swamiji always says, sadhana doesn't bring God. It's not like God is sitting out there somewhere waiting for your sadhana to be good enough and then says, ah, okay, bingo, I'm there. God is always there. But sadhana cleans the windows so we can see God. So yes, it breaks through the veil of multiplicity. It breaks through every veil. Every veil of who we think we are, what we think we know, what we think the universe is, what we think our place in the universe is. It's like the cosmic band-aid getting ripped off, but without any pain, like the the veil being ripped off, not just our eyes, but all of our ways of knowing. So we can see. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. 
Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Is yoga a religion? No. Yoga literally means union. That's what the Sanskrit word means. And so it is a way of the path of yoga, the different streams of yoga, are ways of uniting with the divine. Now that overlaps religion in some way because at its core, at its highest, that's really what religion should do for us. At the fundamental level, religion really should be that which shows us how to connect to God. Not just rules, not just dogma, not just books, not lists, not names, not stories. I mean, all of those are part of it. But those are more, you could think of them as the, the accessories rather than the core, the decoration rather than the content. The content of religion really should be that which unites us with God. And so whether we unite through that which we may call the Hindu, Hindu way of union, or rather what Hindus would call Sanatan Dharm, or the Muslim way, the Islamic way, or the Christian way, or the Jewish way, or the Sikh way, or Jain way, or Buddhist way, or even the way of those who say, I'm spiritual but not religious. That overlap between these streams and yoga is that fundamentally all of these different ways of religion should be giving us a way of uniting with God. Along with that, they give us ways of understanding God, ways of understanding ourselves, ways of understanding the universe and our place in it, ways of understanding how to move through the universe such that we are in alignment with the divine. So in that way, yoga overlaps religion. But it isn't a religion in and of itself. Doing yoga as a Christian, isn't going to change your religion. Doing yoga as a Muslim isn't going to change your religion. Doing yoga as a Jew or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Sikh or a Jain or an atheist isn't going to change your religion. There's no sense of, oh, now that you've stood on your head, your religion has changed. Yoga gives us tools, paths, that apply to every religion. So typically when we talk about yoga, we tend to speak about it either as Gyan Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karm Yoga, this different streams in, so a path of wisdom, knowledge, learning what we call Gyan Yoga, the path of who am I that takes us into an understanding, I am God, a path of what we call bhakti, devotion, love, path of loving God, karma yoga, path of serving God, different ways of attaining union, or sometimes when we talk about yoga, we tend to speak about it in terms of the 
eight limbs of yoga, what we call Ashtanga yoga, given to us by the sage Patanjali. But if you look at the foundation of yoga that he gave us, if you look at the yam and the niyam, what we call more colloquially the yamas and the niyamas, the do's and the don'ts, the Ten Commandments. There's nothing in there about your religion. There's nothing in there about how we must worship God or understand God or refer to God. It's things like nonviolence, truthfulness, non-stealing, non-hoarding. I mean, there are ways of living in the universe with an understanding. The yoga is who I am, not just what I do on a mat. And so that is a, that is the core of yoga. But whether you are a person of a religion or a person of no religion, it doesn't matter. These teachings are for all whether you're being a non-violent, truthful Hindu or a non-violent, truthful Muslim or Christian or Jew, it doesn't matter. So there's nothing in there about changing a religion or converting or adopting a religion. It's about adopting a world view and a self view of oneness and unity rather than separation. And while I'm far from any kind of a scholar on the world's religions, one of the things that I think many of them have in common, or at least the mystic elements, the mystic aspects of many of them have in common, is this awareness, this experience of the lover and the beloved are one. And that's yoga. The eighth limb is samadhi, ecstasy, bliss. Well, why? Why suddenly after I've gone through the seventh limb of meditation, why would I suddenly enter a state of bliss and ecstasy? No pills, no drugs. No, nothing. Where did that bliss and ecstasy come from? I was just sitting here in Dhyan, the seventh limb. How somehow does Samadhi, the eighth limb, come? Well, it comes through union. It's the bliss of union, the ecstasy of union that comes through meditation. Not any particular form not one way or one technique or upon one form of God, but through that deep meditation in which I'm meditating on God, I'm meditating on God, I'm meditating on God, and suddenly the meditator and the object of meditation become one. And it doesn't matter what form of God or name of God I was meditating upon, that union is complete. And that's the samadhi that yoga talks about. So it's deeply spiritual. It brings us that union that religion at its purest should bring us. But in and of itself, it's not a religion. In terms of anything that would stick it in a box that was separate from any other religion. Yoga is that which I think in many ways flows through, flows through our religions and unites us to God. So whatever your religion is, or if you're a committed, adamant atheist. Either way, do yoga. It's going to really, really, really serve you on every level. This brings to a close 
this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time on Ohm Times Radio. Thank you.